Lieutenant William Dillon gathered the survivors from his platoon, joined three Bangalores together, shoved them under the barbed wire, blew a gap, dashed through, crossed the swamp, swam across an anti-tank ditch filled with water, and made it to the base of the bluff. I knew that the Germans had to have a path up the hill that was clear of mines. I looked around. I studied the ground and saw a faint path zigzagging to the left up the hill, so I walked the path very carefully. Something blew up behind me. I looked back and a young soldier had stepped on a mine and it had blown off his foot up to his knee. I brought the others up the path. At the top we saw the first and only Russian soldiers I have ever seen. In his column for June 12, 1944, Ernie Pyle wrote, Now that it is over, it seems to me a pure miracle that we ever took the beach at all. As one officer said, the only way to take a beach is to face it and keep going. It is costly at first, but it's the only way. If the men are pinned down on the beach, dug in and out of action, they might as well not be there at all. They hold up the waves behind them, and nothing is being gained. Our men were pinned down for a while, but finally they stood up and went through, and so we took that beach and accomplished our landing. We did it with every advantage on the enemy's side and every disadvantage on ours. In the light of a couple of days of retrospection, we sit and talk and call it a miracle that our men ever got on at all or were able to stay on. It was not a miracle. It was infantry. The plan had called for the air and naval bombardments, followed by tanks and dozers, to blast a path through the exits so that the infantry could march up the draws and engage the enemy. But the plan had failed, utterly and completely failed. As is almost always the case in war, it was up to the infantry. It became the infantry's job to open the exits so that the vehicles could drive up the draws and engage the enemy. Exhortation and Example backed by two years of training, got the G.I.s from the 16th Regiment to overcome their exhaustion, confusion and fear, and get out from behind the shingle and start up the bluff. Colonel Taylor and many others pointed out the obvious, that to stay behind the shelter was to die. Retreat was not possible. Captain Dawson, Lieutenant Spaulding and Dillon, and many others provided the example. Their actions proved that it was possible to cross the swamp, the anti-tank ditch, the minefields, and find paths to the top of the bluff. As they came onto the beach, the junior officers and NCOs saw at once that the intricate plan, the one they had studied so hard and committed to memory, bore no relationship whatsoever to the tactical problem they faced. They had expected to find ready-made craters on the beach, blasted by the bombs from the B-17s, to provide shelter in the unlikely event that they encountered any small arms fire when they made the shoreline. They had expected to go up the draws, which they anticipated would have been cleared by the DD tanks and dozers, to begin fighting up on the high ground. They had expected fire support from tanks, half-tracks, artillery. Nothing they had expected had happened. Yet their training had prepared them for this challenge. They sized up the situation, saw what had to be done, and did it. This was leadership of the highest order. It came from men who had been civilians three or even two years earlier. Soot John Ellery of the 16th Regiment was one of those leaders. When he reached the shingle, I had to peer through a haze of sweat, smoke, dust and mist. There was a dead man beside him, another behind him. Survivors gathered around him. I told them that we had to get off the beach and that I'd lead the way. He did. When he got to the base of the bluff, he started up, four or five men following. About halfway up, a machine gun opened up on them from the right. I scurried and scratched along until I got within ten metres of the gun position. Then I unloaded all four of my fragmentation grenades. When the last one went off, I made a dash for the top. The other kids were right behind me, and we all made it. I don't know if I knocked out that gun crew, but they stopped shooting. Those grenades were all the return fire I provided coming off that beach. I didn't fire a round from either my rifle or my pistol. In giving his account, Ellery spoke about leadership. After the war, he said, I read about a number of generals and colonels who are said to have wandered about exhorting the troops to advance. That must have been very inspirational. I suspect, however, 
that the men were more interested and more impressed by junior officers and NCOs who were willing to lead them rather than having some general pointing out the direction in which they should go. Warming to the subject, Ellery went on, I didn't see any generals in my area of the beach, but I did see a captain and two lieutenants who demonstrated courage beyond belief as they struggled to bring order to the chaos around them. Those officers managed to get some men organised and moving up the bluff. One of the lieutenants had a broken arm that hung limply at his side, but he led a group of seven to the top, even though he got hit again on the way. Another lieutenant carried one of his wounded men 30 metres before getting hit himself. When you talk about combat leadership under fire on the beach at Normandy, Ellery concluded, I don't see how the credit can go to anyone other than the company-grade officers and senior NCOs who led the way. It is good to be reminded that there are such men, that there always have been and always will be. We sometimes forget, I think, that you can manufacture weapons and you can purchase ammunition, but you can't buy valour and you can't pull heroes off an assembly line. The truth of Ellery's strongly felt opinion is obvious, but it is not the whole truth nor is it fair to Colonel Taylor or to General Cota, nor is it fair to the assembly line. It was the assembly line that had gotten the 16th Regiment and all the others across the Atlantic Ocean, across the English Channel, and to the Normandy beach with weapons in their hands. Courage and bold leadership had taken over at that point and put small groups of infantry on top of the bluff, but without support they were not going to do much damage to the Germans or even stay there long. They had to have reinforcements, and not just infantry reinforcements. In a way, the men on the top were in a position similar to World War I infantry, who led the way through no man's land in frontal assaults. They had penetrated the enemy trench system, but as with their fathers in World War I, the follow-up waves were taking machine gun fire from the flanks while enemy artillery pounded them from the rear. The men in front were isolated. This was where the incredible production feats of American industry came into play. The larger landing craft, the LCMs and LCTs and LSTs and Rhino barges, were, by AO830 or so, bringing in a staggering quantity of armed and armoured vehicles. The 16th Regiment at Omaha already had lost more vehicles in the water and on the beach, all of them brought from across the Atlantic than the entire German 352nd Division ever dreamed existed. And there were almost uncountable numbers of other vehicles waiting an opportunity to land. But at 0830, all those tanks, DUKWs, half-tracks, self-propelled artillery, trucks and jeeps were more of a problem than a solution. And it was getting worse, because as the tide moved toward its high-water mark, the beach area kept shrinking. At this point, General Bradley contemplated sending follow-up waves over to the British beaches, because until someone could open the drawers so the vehicles could exit the beach and get up to the road net on the high ground, the vehicles caught in the traffic jam on the beach were just targets, not weapons. In North Africa in 1943, General Eisenhower had reprimanded a general officer who had built an elaborate bomb-proof underground HQ for himself, where he stayed during the Kasserine Pass battle. Eisenhower told him to go on a front-line inspection tour and explained to the reluctant warrior the simplest truth of war. Generals are expendable just as is any other item in an army. War is waste. Men and equipment, and generals, are expendable, so long as their destruction or death contributes to the ultimate goal of victory. At Omaha Beach, they were expended in fearful numbers. Hundreds of young men and boys trained at enormous expense were killed, many, perhaps most of them, before they could fire one shot. Equipment losses were staggering. Hundreds of tanks, trucks, self-propelled artillery, jeeps and landing craft of all types went to the bottom or were destroyed on the beach by German artillery. Thousands of radios, rifles, machine guns, ammunition boxes, K&D rations, bars, bazookas, flamethrowers, gas masks, hand grenades and other materiel were destroyed, abandoned or sunk. The equipment had made a long journey, from factories in California, Illinois, Michigan and the Deep South, to East Coast ports, then across the Atlantic to England, by truck or rail to Portsmouth, finally across the Channel, only to go to the Channel Bottom off Omaha Beach. 
Some of those vehicles still rest there today. Aside from the German gunners, the major culprits were the runnels, deep trenches just inside the shallow sandbars and the mined obstacles, which at high water took a ghastly toll. The first vehicles on Omaha Beach were Sherman tanks. They arrived at H hour minus 30 seconds in Lotter Dean Rockwell's flotilla. The LCTs hit a sandbar 15 metres or so off the shoreline, where they dropped their ramps and the tanks drove off. Those coming off Rockwell's LCT dipped into the runnel, gunned their waterproofed engines and climbed toward the beach. As the tanks went clanking and grinding down the ramp, a German 80T Mittiter gun that was enfilading the beach took them under fire. As Rockwell retracted, he noticed two of the tanks get hit by 88 shells. One of them was burning. The following two and others from the battalion stayed offshore, about half underwater, and commenced firing their machine guns and 75 Imileto cannons. Not all the tanks got that far. Enns F. S. White, skipper of LCT-713, later reported to Rockwell. The ramp was again lowered and the first tank was launched. The water was much deeper than expected, and as the tank went off the ramp, it went to the bottom and settled. The tank commander gave the order to abandon tank, and the entire crew was brought back to the ship by means of a heaving line thrown from the ship. Ensign White retracted, moved 100 metres east, and beached a second time. The other three tanks made it to the water's edge, even as LCT-713 took a direct hit. Bartesatu J.C. Friedman was a tank driver in the 747th Tank Battalion. His LCT came in on the third wave. Through his periscope he could see tanks, half-tracks, jeeps and trucks being blown up by landmines. The noise of gunfire and gunpowder as well as the smell of death seemed to be all around us. Everyone in my tank was praying. I kept thinking, is this the end of me? Constant shelling and shrapnel flying off the tank seemed to indicate an unleashing of the powers of hell. I wondered if all this was worth the lives taken and if we would see the next day. Cole John Upham commanded the 743rd Tank Battalion. It went in on the heels of the first wave. He stayed a few hundred metres offshore, directing his tanks by radio. When his LCT went in at 08 Social, he jumped over the side and waded ashore to join his tanks. Still on foot, he began to direct their fire. A rifle bullet tore through his right shoulder, but he refused medical attention. He came upon for Charles Levesque and Sieplo, William Beckett, who had abandoned their tank after a track had been knocked off. Upham, his right arm dangling uselessly, directed them to the seawall. Beckett commented, You couldn't get the colonel excited, not even then. Sergeant Paul Radzom was excited. He was in command of a half-track equipped with multi-barreled 50 caliber machine guns. As his LCT approached the shore, machine gun rounds started bouncing off the side. The ramp went down and out we go. We were not supposed to be in more than eight feet of water. They dumped us off in 15 feet. Our track didn't go anywhere but down. I had the boys elevate that barrel straight up in the air, as high as it would go. There was about six inches of that barrel up above the water when the swells weren't hitting it. I lost everything, including my helmet. I swam back and got back on that ramp, and the rest of the crew did too, except old Mo Dingledine, who couldn't swim. Last time I saw Mo, he was clinging to that barrel. Never found out what happened to old Mo. Radzom's LCT backed off and came in again. He jumped on Sergeant Evanger's half-track as it drove off the ramp. His crew followed him. The track made it to shore. There was supposed to be a road cleared out for us. Then we were supposed to go in about five miles and secure a position. We couldn't have gotten five yards. The track got hit and Radzom jumped off. He picked up a helmet, then a rifle. I saw a first Louis laying there dead. There was the neck of a bottle sticking out of his musette bag. I snitched it. It was a bottle of black and white scotch. He rejoined Avenger's crew and passed the bottle around. That was the first time and the only time in my life that I drank scotch. I never felt a thing. He got hit with shrapnel in the face, side and back, and eventually was evacuated. Seaplay George Ryan was a gunner on a 105mm howitzer. 
The vehicle was called an M7. The cannon was mounted on a Sherman tank chassis. There were four M7s on the LCT. The skipper saw that his designated landing site on Easy Red was too hot, so he said he was going down a little way to find a softer spot. Nobody was arguing with him, Ryan remembered. The skipper turned toward shore, and just that quick the craft was stuck on a sandbar. Ryan's CO shouted, Every man for himself! And over the side the CO jumped. Holy smokes, Ryan remarked. He was just gone. We lowered the ramp. Everybody in the first M7 took a deep breath and they gave it the gun. Down the ramp they went and into the water. The thing almost disappeared from sight, but the driver gave it the gun and broom, right out of the water it came. He did it so fast. The second M7 drove off, and it went glonk. It just disappeared from sight. The guys started popping up like corks. They swam in. Shells were bursting around the LCT. We gotta get off this thing, someone in Ryan's crew shouted, and they all jumped into the water. Ryan held back. I wasn't so much afraid of them bullets or the shells as I was of the cold channel water. I cannot swim. Ryan threw off all his equipment, inflated his May West, and began to tiptoe in off the ramp when some German opened up on the side of the LCT with his machine gun. Blubble -bl blang. That convinced me. Into the water I dove. I pushed with all my might, and then I started going. I'm swimming and I'm swimming. Somebody taps me on the shoulder and I look up. I was in a foot of water, swimming. You talk about the will to live. If they hadn't stopped me, I would have swam two miles inland. Ryan made it to the seawall. He threw himself down beside a 16th Regiment infantryman. You got a cigarette? Ryan asked. A bit later, a piece of shrapnel made a scratch on Ryan's hand. Nothing much. Almost like a cat would give you. Soon a medical officer came along. He said, Every man on this beach deserves the Purple Heart just for being here. If you are wounded, I can take care of you. If you are dead, I can't. If there's nothing wrong with you, I can see that you get a purple heart anyway. How about this, Major? Ryan asked, showing his scratch. The doctor said he would get him the medal. But Ryan thought, No, I can't do this. It would cheapen it so much. A guy loses a leg and gets the purple heart. I get it for a scratch. That just ain't fair. I turned it down. Another crew chief on an M7 was Sergeant Jerry Edes. There were two M7s on his LCT. They were hooked by cable to two half-tracks behind. Directly behind one of the half-tracks, also connected by cable, was a truck, while a jeep was behind the other. The M7s were supposed to drag a half-track and a truck or jeep to shore. As the landing craft approached the beach, the 105mm howitzers fired at the bluff. At first, it was just like a picnic, because no one was firing back. All of a sudden shells hit the water around us, and we knew we were back in the war. We came alive. It was a feeling of, well, I don't know how to explain fear. A feeling that went over you that you knew that the next breath could be your last. Of course, we were continuing to do our job. They would fire, lower the elevation, fire again, one shell every thirty seconds. There were some GIs, infantry, on the LCT. There was nothing they could do but... Wait for the slaughter. Us guys on the guns, at least we felt like we were doing something, shooting back. As long as you were shooting, you felt like you were in the war. But as for me, I would think, let me hold my control, not let the guys see how scared I am, not loser control. That was my biggest fear, being caught afraid. At 2,000 metres, the howitzers could not depress sufficiently to hit the bluff, so they stopped firing. German machine gun bullets began to zing off the LCT. I got down as low as possible, wishing I could push right on through the bottom of the boat with the helpless feeling of, I can't do anything now. The LCT was going awfully slow. We were all having that urge like at a horse race, kind of shaking your shoulders to get the horse to run faster. We were trying to get this boat to go faster. Edies looked at his watch. It was Hoantatsi. All of a sudden I was real hungry. 
My thoughts drifted back to Abar and Grill in El Paso, when I was in the old horse cavalry down there, the California Bar and Grill. They served a tremendous big taco for Point Ten and an ice-cold Falstaff beer for Point Ten. I could imagine myself sitting there at the bar with a beer and a taco for Point Twenty, and here I was with maybe two hundred dollars in my pocket and I couldn't even buy a beer and taco. When the LCT grounded on a sandbar after three unsuccessful tries and dropped the ramp, the skipper was running madly around the boat shouting, Get them damn things off my boat! Get those damn things off my boat! My lieutenant had his arm up. When he dropped his arm forward, I kicked the driver in the back of the hid and off we went. I heard a kind of gloob gloob blub blub sound. The water was deeper than our air intake and we were immediately flooded. Edie's thought about all the stuff we had just lost. The Navy boys had given us 50 pounds of sugar, 30 pounds of coffee, 50 cartons of cigarettes, and we had lost all this stuff, and our gun. Edie's made it to shore and up to the shingle, where he asked himself, just what in the hell am I doing here when I could be back in Fen Bliss, Texas? He was old army, with an arm full of hash marks, an experienced gold brick who knew how to avoid the tough assignments and garner the soft ones. To his consternation, he ended up spending D-Day as a rifleman on Omaha Beach, about the worst predicament an old soldier could find himself in. He organised a kind of a provisional platoon of infantry, engineers and artillery men, and up the bluff he led them. Because so many vehicles went glub-glub, many specialists found themselves ending up as ordinary infantry. Capt. R. J. Lindo was a liaison officer for the Navy. He landed at 0730, with two men to carry his radio. His job was to direct naval gunfire in support of the 18th Regiment. But my worst fears and my best training were for naught, as we lost our radios coming in from the LCT to the beach. So there I was helpless to assist in any way. I became instead a part of the infantry attack. Sergeant William Otlowski, a veteran of North Africa and Sicily, came in on a due KW. He was in command of an M7, which was far too heavy for the due KWs to carry in anything but calm water. His due KW was slammed up and down by a wave as it backed off its LST ramp. The rudder hit the ramp and got bent. So we're going around in little tight circles and we can't straighten out. So the coxswain, a navy boy, he decided to shut off the motor, which was a mistake, because that shut off the pumps and the Duke W started to fill with water and of course we sank. Otlowski yelled at his crew to keep together, hold hands, stay in a circle. A passing LCVP, returning to its mother ship for another load, picked them up. They transferred to a rhino ferry. The rhino hit a sandbar. A lieutenant tied a rope to a jeep and told the driver to take off to test the water depth. The jeep promptly sank. Hey men, the lieutenant called out. Grab the rope and pull up the jeep. Just then an 88 burst on one side of the rhino, then another on the far side. Otlowski yelled to the lieutenant. Those are 88s and the third one's going to hit right in the middle. Get your men off this boat. He said, Sergeant, stay where you are. I said, to hell with you, Lieutenant. If you want to die, go ahead. OK, men, let's go. Otlowski and his crew jumped ship and swam to shore. I looked back. The third 88 had hit smack in the middle of that damn barge, and every consecutive shot was right on target. Otlowski picked up a rifle, ammunition belt and helmet, and scooted up across the beach to the seawall. He saw a young soldier walking behind it with a big roll of communication wire on his back. A lieutenant spotted the soldier and called out, Oh boy, do we need that? Sit down right here. Give me that wire. The soldier replied, I can't, lieutenant. What will I do with this? In his right hand, he was carrying his left arm. Otlowski helped get the wire off his back, gave him some morphine and yelled for a medic. Charles Sullivan was a CB on a rhino. He helped bring in three loads on D-Day. Most of the vehicles were destroyed before they could fire a shot, but he concluded, In 28 years of service, three wars, 14 overseas tours of duty, thousands of faces, only Normandy and D-Day remain vivid, as if it happened only yesterday. What we did was important and worthwhile, 
and how many ever get to say that about a day in their lives. Sullivan's comment brings to mind Eisenhower's remark to Walter Cronkite that no one likes to get shot at, but on D-Day more people wanted to get in on it than wanted to get out. A tremendous tonnage of tanks, half-tracks, M7s, jeeps, trucks and other vehicles had attempted to come into Omaha between 0630 and 0830. Many had sunk, others were destroyed, and the few survivors were caught on an ever-shrinking beach with no place to go. The vehicles were more of a problem than they were an offensive weapon. Beside and between the tanks, half-tracks, M7s and the rest, the Higgins boats were coming in, carrying the 116th and 16th regiments. With them were demolition teams composed of CBs and army engineers. There were 16 teams, each assigned to a distinct sector of the beach with the job of blowing a gap some 50 metres wide. Not one landed on target. A CB described his experience. As we dropped our ramp, an 80 mm came tearing in, killing almost half our men right there, the officer being the first one. We all thought him the best officer the Navy ever had. From then on, things got hazy to me. I remember the chief starting to take over, but then another shell hit and that did it. I thought my body torn apart. Bleeding heavily from shrapnel in his left leg and arm, the CB looked around and saw no one alive. Fire on the Higgins boat was about to set off the demolition charges. So I went overboard and headed for the beach. He reached the obstacles, looked back and saw the craft blow up. That got me. Not caring whether I lived or not, I started to run through the fire up the beach. He made the seawall, later picked up a rifle, and spent the day with the 116th as an infantryman. Other demolition teams had better luck. They got off their craft more or less intact and went to work, ignoring the fire around them. They were better off than the infantry, the GIs who landed at the wrong place and whose officers were wounded or killed before they made the seawall, did not know what to do next. Not even heavy gunfire put such a strain on a soldier's morale as not knowing what to do and having no one around to tell him. The demolition teams, however, could see immediately what to do. Even if they were at the wrong place, there were obstacles in front of them. They started blowing them. Comder Joseph Gibbons was the CO of the demolition teams at Omaha. He strode up and down the beach, giving help where it was required, supervising the operation. The first two of his men he met told him the whole of the rest of their team had been killed. They had no explosives with them. Gibbons told them to get behind the seawall until he found a job for them. Then he found a team that had landed successfully and was already fastening its charges to the obstacles. The men moved methodically from one obstacle to another, fixing the charges to them. Part Devon Larson of the engineers made it ashore. He was alone, but he had his explosives with him, so he went to work anyway. Lying on the beach, I saw only two steel obstacles in front of me, both with telemines atop of them. I wrapped a composition sea pack around the base, piled about a foot of sand on my side so that the explosion would be away from me, pulled a fuse lighter from my helmet, yelled, fire in the hole, and pulled the fuse. I heard several more shouts of, fire in the hole, to my left. I rolled to the right. The explosion rolled me a little farther, but my two steel posts were gone. No more obstacles were in front of me or on either side, so I headed for the seawall. Altogether, the demolition teams were able to blow five or six partial gaps instead of the sixteen that had been planned, and the gaps that did exist were not properly marked by flags. As the tide rose, this situation caused immense problems for the coxswains bringing in the follow-up waves of infantry and vehicles. Seaman Exum Pike was on patrol craft 565. The job was to guide LCIs and other craft into the beach, but with landmarks obscured by smoke and haze, and with no clear path through the obstacles, PC-565 could not accomplish its mission. It became, in effect, a gunboat, firing its machine guns at the bluff, from which Pike could see a rain of fire that appeared to be falling from the clouds. Pike remembered seeing a DUKW hit an obstacle and set off the mine. I saw the bodies of two crewmen blown several hundred feet into the air, and they were twisting around like tops up there, 
It was like watching a slow-motion Ferris wheel. Then PC-565 took a hit. Six men were wounded. Blood was gushing down the gunwales of that boat like a river. Recalling the scene 45 years later, Pike commented, I have often told my two sons I have no fear of hell because I have already been there. Ernst Don Irwin was the skipper of LCT-614. His crew consisted of another ensign, the executive officer, and 12 Navy enlisted men. His cargo consisted of 65 GIs, two bulldozers, and four jeeps with ammunition-carrying trailers. He was scheduled to go in at 07.30. As we headed toward the beach, Irwin recalled, the most ear-splitting, deafening, horrendous sound I have ever heard or ever will took place. The Texas was firing over the top of LCT-614. Irwin looked back, and it seemed as if the Texas's giant 14-inch guns were pointed right at us. Of course they were not. They were aiming at the bluff. You'll never know how tremendously huge a battleship is, Irwin commented, until you look up at one from fairly close by from an LCT. Irwin was headed toward Easy Red. So far, no Americans had landed on that section of the beach. To Irwin, it seemed tranquil. He allowed himself to think that the briefing officer had been right when he said, There won't be anything left to bother you guys when you hit the beach. We're throwing everything at the Germans but the kitchen sink, and we'll throw that in too. But as Irwin ran LCT-614 onto a sandbar and dropped the ramp, all hell tore loose. We came under intense fire, mainly rifle and machine gun. When the first two men from the craft went down in water over their heads, Irwin realised the water was still too deep, so he used his rear anchor and winch to retract. He spent the next hour trying to find a gap in the obstacles where he could put his cargo ashore. Finally he dropped the ramp again. The bulldozers made it to the shore, only to be blasted by German gunners with phosphorus shells which started them burning. The GIs were trying to get off, but when the first two got shot as they jumped off the ramp, the others refused to leave. Irwin had orders to disembark them. The orders stressed that to fail to do so could result in a court-martial. He had been told that, if necessary, he should see to the execution of the order to disembark at gunpoint. But I could in no way force human beings to step off that ramp to almost certain wounding or death. The shell fire had grown even more intense. Pandemonium everywhere, with lots of smoke and explosions, bodies in the water. The men in my crew, who were still at their battle stations and who had been standing erect on our way to the beach, were now flattened out against the craft as if they were a part of it. A couple of them were yelling, Skipper, let's get out of here. After an hour of trying to get my load of troops and vehicles off, believe me I was ready. It was now 083.0. Men and vehicles, almost none of them operating, were jammed up on the beach. Not a single vehicle, and not more than a few platoons of men had made it up the bluff. At this point, the commander of the 7th Naval Beach Battalion made a decision. Suspend all landing of vehicles and withdraw those craft on the beach. Ensign Irwin got the order to retract over his radio. It was the most welcome order he ever received, but the one that he had the most difficulty in executing. As he began to retract, his LCT suddenly stopped. It could have been panic time, but Irwin kept his head. He eased forward, then back again, and floated free. His crew began taking in the anchor cable, but just when the anchor should have been in sight, it stuck. Try as we might, we couldn't free that anchor. I gave the command, all engines ahead, full. This did cause the anchor to move, and soon coming to the surface was a Higgins boat that had been sunk with our anchor hooked into it. Irwin turned his LCT gave it a couple of shakes and freed the anchor. He got out to deep water and dropped the anchor. The Aero 830 general order to retract craft on the beach and postpone the landing of others until gaps in the obstacles had been blown added to the confusion. With nowhere to go, over 50 incoming LCTs and LCIs began to turn in circles. For most of the skippers and crews, this was the first invasion. They were amateurs at war even the old merchant mariners commanding the LSTs. The crews were as young as they were inexperienced. 
Seaman James Fudge was on one of the two LSTs that had made it to the beach. When the order came to get off, this is where our ship got in trouble, where our captain panicked. We had dropped our stern anchor, we had not unloaded a thing, the LST to our right got hit with an 88, and what our skipper needed to do was give the order, haul in the stern anchor, all back full. But he said, all back full, and forgot about the anchor, so he backed over his stern anchor cable and fouled the screws. The LST was helpless in the water, about 500 metres offshore. Eventually it was offloaded by a rhino. Fudge said, It was quite difficult to unload tanks from the LST to the rhino. You had to have a crane. It was a terrible time in a somewhat choppy sea to have a barge to unload trucks and tanks without dropping them in the water. But we didn't lose any. Fudge recalled that an admiral came by on an LCVP and in front of the whole crew he scolded our skipper for being so thoughtless as to back over his own cable. He had some very insulting things to say to our skipper, directly. He was a very angry man. At about 09, Vakont, zooming in from the British beaches, came two FW 190s. The pilots were Wing Comder, Josef Priller and Sergeant Heinz Vodarczyk. Ryan recorded that when they saw the invasion fleet, Priller's words were, What a show, what a show! They flew at 150 feet, dodging between the barrage balloons. Fudge commented, I can remember standing sort of in awe of them, and everyone was trying to fire at them. People were shouting, Look, look, a couple of jerrys! Every 40 milliton and 20 milliton in the fleet blasted away. So far as Fudge could make out, many of the gunners were hitting the ship next to them. So low were Prilla and Vodarczyk flying. No one hit the planes. As Prilla and Vodarczyk streaked off into the clouds, one seaman commented, Jerry or not, the best of luck to you. You've got guts. There was one battalion of black soldiers in the initial assault on Omaha, the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. It was a unique outfit attached to the First Army. The troopers brought in barrage balloons on LSTs and LCIs in the third wave and set them up on the beach to prevent Luftwaffe strafing. Black Coast Guard personnel drove Higgins boats and black sailors manned their battle stations on the warships. Overall, however, it was remarkable that so few black servicemen were allowed to participate in the initial attack against the Nazi regime, and a terrible waste considering the contributions of black combat troops in Korea and Vietnam. It was the Navy's job to get the men to shore, the tankers' and artillerymen's jobs to provide suppressing fire, the infantryman's job to move out and up, the demolition team's job to blow gaps in the obstacles, and the engineer's job to blow remaining obstacles, provide traffic control on the beach, blast the exits open and clear and mark paths through the minefields. For the engineers, as for the others, the first couple of hours on Omaha were full of frustration. Sergeant Robert Schober was with the 3466 Ordnance Maintenance Company, his unit's job was to do waterproof vehicles. The task was simple. Tighten fan belts, open battery vents, remove packing from various parts of the engine. When Howell got to the beach, I felt a ding on the helmet. When I realised it was a bullet, I was no longer scared. I made up my mind that when the next wave of infantry took off for the seawall, I was going too. I did, and dug in when I arrived. He and his buddies stayed there through the morning because they could not locate any vehicles that needed dewaterproofing. At least they made it to the wall. CPL, Robert Miller, a combat engineer with the 6th ESB, did not. He was in an LCT that landed around 07 Dauza Zaras on Easy Red. He glanced to his right and saw another LCT with the skipper standing at the tower receive a blow from the dreaded German 88. After the smoke cleared, both the skipper and tower had disappeared. Miller worried about the trucks packed full of dynamite on his LCT taking a hit from an 88, but that turned out to be the wrong worry. The craft was rocked by a blast from an underwater mine. The ramp was jammed, a half-track up front badly damaged, many of the men on board wounded. The skipper decided to pull back to dump off the half-track, transfer the wounded, and repair the ramp. 
As this was being done, a Navy officer in a control craft pulled alongside and raised hell with the skipper, saying we should not be sitting there and to get our A into the beach where we belonged. The skipper took the LCT back in and managed to drop the ramp in eight feet of water about 100 metres offshore. He told the engineers, Go! Miller's platoon commander objected. In no uncertain terms, reminding the skipper his orders were to run us onto the beach, but the skipper refused to budge. A jeep drove off. It went under water, but the waterproofing worked and it managed to drive to the shore. The trucks also made it, only to get shot up. The men came next. Miller went in over his head. He dropped his rifle and demolition charges, jumped up from the channel floor, got his head above water, and started swimming to the beach. The weight of the soaked clothes, boots, gas mask and steel helmet made it near impossible, but I did reach hip-deep water finally and attempted to stand up. I was near exhaustion. At last I reached shore and was about fifteen feet up the beach when a big white flash enveloped me. The next thing I knew I was flat on my back looking up at the sky. I tried to get up but could not and reasoned, my God, my legs had been blown off since I had no sensation of movement in them and could not see them for the gas mask on my chest blocked the view. I wrestled around and finally got the gas mask off to one side. I saw my feet sticking up and reached my upper legs with my hands and felt relieved that they were still there, but could not understand my immobility or lack of sensation. Miller had been hit in the spinal cord. It was damaged beyond repair. Those first steps he took on Omaha Beach were the last steps he ever took. A medic dragged him behind a half-track and gave him a shot of morphine. Four months later, he was in a stateside hospital. A nurse was washing his hair. To her and my own astonishment, sand was in the rinse water, sand from Omaha Beach.